So in the afternoon, we're going to cover some new material, uh, some more advanced material, uh, starting with one-sided communication. Uh, and we'll also look at process topologies and topology mapping and neighborhood collectives. So some of these things are new in MPI3. Uh, some of the one-sided is new, and the neighborhood collectives are new, and, uh, and, and some of the, the topology mapping stuff is also new from MPI 2.2. So let's, uh, and we'll, we'll have some hands-on uh, with respect to that, and, and Bill will also look, uh, go through the code in a little more detail. Uh, some of you didn't quite understand what is where in the code because we just, we just gave you the source file. So after, after my talk on one-sided, Bill will go through the code in a little bit so that you'll understand how it's laid out, and that'll make it a little easier. MPI, as far as MPI 1 is concerned, had point-to-point -point communication, the sends, receives, the collectives, data types, uh, some basic topology stuff, and, and a few odds and ends. Uh, and that was enough for, for many users, many applications, and even today they, they just uh, happily use that stuff. Uh, and then MPI 2 came along, in, uh, that, that was 1997, it, it, it's a while ago, and added new features, uh, one of which was one-sided communication. Uh, the other was uh, parallel I.O., which we won't talk about today because there's a, an I.O. talk next week, so they, they'll cover some of that. Uh, there was dynamic process management, and the idea there is that uh, you can add to the number of processes in an MPI program, or you can connect separately started MPI applications. We're not covering that today because on, on these large uh, systems, the IBM and Create, they don't support the dynamic process, uh, as Rusty said uh, yesterday, because the interactions with that, of that with their, uh, this, uh, the job scheduling and, and the resource managers is, a, is a little tricky. So they don't support that, so we didn't try to cover it here. And there were other things like uh, Fortran 90 bindings and C++ bindings and a few other odds and ends. So this was a... a a major part of MPI 2, and in MPI 3, they have, uh, we have added things to one-sided communication. So, this, so there were some drawbacks with MPI 2 one-sided, which have now been fixed in MPI 3 by adding uh, uh, more stuff. So it's still backward compatible, nothing has changed, and the basic model hasn't changed. There are uh, uh, more functions and, uh, and a few other things. So let, we'll, we'll look at that. The basic idea of one-sided communication is to uh, decouple data movement from process uh, synchronization, and also to not involve the, the other, the target process, as far as possible, in the data transfer. So you, by, by one-sided, uh, the source specifies both the, the, the buffer on the origin side as well as the address uh, or the location on the target side where the data has to be placed. So there is no send matched by a receive which provides the receive buffer and that's where the data goes. The send, uh, the, the, the put, which is the one-sided equivalent of send, puts data directly into a location in the, uh, in the target buffer. And how this is done, I mean, there is a particular way, of, you, you can't just write anywhere into the other process's memory, there is a, uh, there's a method to it. And so we'll see how that is done. So to begin with, when you just have MPI processes, uh, each process has its own private memory region, which any other process cannot directly access, uh, other than by using sends and receives. But again, send and receive means the receiving process has called the function and is, is you know, actively involved in, in, in gathering, in collecting that data. So in one-sided uh, communication, what you have to uh, do is you have to call a function, uh, it's, uh, it's called a window creation uh, function, uh, that will expose some portion of your private memory to one-sided operations from uh, another process. And after this function has been called, and you know, that's also a collective function, and, and we'll look at how that is done, then a process, say zero, could put data directly into somewhere in this memory, and it can specify where, or it could fetch data directly from this memory, and that's an MPI get. Or it could do other operations like MPI accumulate, which does some arithmetic operation and, and so forth. So it's explicit what, what you expose of, of your uh, memory. And by memory, I mean some data structure. So you could take some array in, in your process and, and create this window out of it, and then that will become visible to other processes for uh, one-sided communication. OK. so that public memory region or win window effectively becomes like a global address space in the sense that you can directly 
but you cannot read write to it just by load and store operations. You cannot do a something equal to a thousand and, and uh, in that way you have to call an, uh, a function, the MPI put or MPI get function for that. So just to compare one-sided with, with two-sided, if you, in the two-sided model, the pro, say rank zero calls uh, send with a buff count data type. So there's an address count data type. That data goes here and there's a receive somewhere which also has a buff count data. So there's, the receiver has specified the memory where the data will get copied into. And there's some delay while this, while this happens. And even the sender may get blocked until the send completes because it's a, it's a blocking send. What happens in the, uh, the one-sided model is, the, is rank zero does a put of some data and it takes some time to get there and it gets stored without rank one calling any, any function on that side. And similarly, get means get this data from a specific location and that gets returned uh, here to, to rank zero. So it's, it's somewhat like a non-blocking communication model, but it doesn't involve a function call on the, uh, on the target side, except for synchronization. So there's some synchronization is needed, uh, which we'll also talk about. What, what are the advantages of uh, one-sided? Uh, one is that you can do multiple data transfers with a single synchronization operation. So you can do uh, many puts and gets and then finally call an MPI win fence or some synchronization to, uh, to complete all that operations. So that's similar to the bulk synchronous parallel mo uh, model for parallel computing. Uh, there is no uh, tag matching. In MPI sends and receives, as I said, there's a tag and the receive has a tag and they have to match. So that means on the receive side, it has to look through the queue for messages that match that tag and so forth and then pick the right message and so forth. All that can be bypassed in one side. There's no tag. It gets written directly to the destination memory. So it's, it's potentially faster uh, in that sense. And some irregular communication patterns can be more, more easily expressed uh, in a one-sided model. Because if you don't know beforehand what you're, you know, whom, whom you're sending to or you know, whom you're receiving from, uh, then it's easier to express that in a one-sided ma manner and let it happen. Otherwise, you need an additional step to figure out, okay, who's going to send to me, who, who all do I need to send to, and there's additional communication needed just to issue the two-sided uh, operations. And on some systems, uh, you know, particularly those with hardware support for remote memory access, it can also be faster than uh, the point-to-point. -point. Uh, I think this just uh, repeats what I said, that if the communication pattern is not known a, a priori, then this is a better uh, alternative in many cases. So what, what do you need to know uh, uh, in MPI R RMA is how do you create this memory that is remotely accessible, that public uh, portion that I said, and how do, you, how do you update it, and what's the method of synchronization? And the, in MPI 3, there's also a memory model, something about the memory model that's been added. I don't know if we'll have time to cover that because that's a little, uh, can be a little bit uh, involved. So uh, f first, how do you create this, uh, this public memory? So by default, if you allocate any memory in your MPI program, uh, either statically or dynamically, that is locally accessible. It, it, it's not uh, directly visible for RMA. You have to take an explicit step to make it visible. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the term in MPI for uh, remotely accessible memory is called a, a window. So we'll be using that term window quite a bit in, in, in this portion. So window refers to nothing but the memory that you have exposed to uh, other processes. And MPI returns a handle to that window, which is called a, a window object. And it's of type M MPI underscore win. So all your uh, RMA functions will have MPI underscore win as, instead of the communicator, there's this window object as a parameter to that um, RMA function. So that specifies this. And a, a group of processes collectively create uh, uh, a window. And in MPI, the original MPI2 had only one function for creating the window. It was MPI win create, which was collectively called, and everyone specified their buffer that was to be part of this uh, window. Or you could pass null, and then you went on. And there are a few more in MPI3, so I, uh, we'll, we'll cover all that. And then once this thing is created, then you can do your read writes without explicitly involving the other process. So just to, to explain that uh, in, in this figure. So this is rank zero's uh, address space and rank one's and two and three's address space. In each of these, you can pick a, 
a memory region, typically it's a data structure. So you have allocated some array or something. Uh, it's some contiguous portion. So, so it typically corresponds to some data structure you have allocated. If you have two different data structures that are not contiguous, you'll need to create two separate uh, windows. So let's say you have this one as this region, this region, and, and, uh, and this region. So all these have to be passed to the winCreate function to create a window object. And after you have done that, rank zero can call MPI get, uh, and we'll see what the parameters are, how do you call it, but what, and suppose the get is from rank one, it will get some data from the window of rank one into the uh, private memory of rank zero. And similarly, you, if you do a put, you can do a put directly from your private memory into the window of rank three or wherever you want to uh, send it. So the basic functions are MPI win create, which is collective, and it creates the window object. And at the end of it, when you're done with all your RMA, you're supposed to free it. Uh, MPI put moves data from local memory to remote memory. MPI get is the reverse it, uh, in the opposite direction. A third operation is MPI accumulate, which is like a reduction, but it's not a collective reduction. It is you're transferring. It's a put with an arithmetic operation at the target. So. If you do a sum, then it will move this data there and do a sum on the data on that side, and the result will be uh, stored there. Uh, all these operations are non-blocking, so and they do not; these ones do not return a request object. They are they are just non-blocking by definition, and you need some sub, some synchronization function to be called after them to complete the operation. So it's similar to the I send and the test and wait, except that these don't these don't return a request object. Uh, and these are the original functions from MPI2. So MPI2 had basically these functions for data for one-sided and some functions for synchronization. Uh, MPI3 has added more functions, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so how do you create a window, as I said? So the basic one from MPI2 is MPI win create, where you have to allocate a buffer beforehand and then call MPI win create to make it visible. You have to pass an allocated buffer to MPI win create. Win allocate, yeah, so these are new functions from MPI3. Uh, win allocate is different from this in, in that you don't have to allocate the buffer. MPI will allocate the buffer and, uh, and give it to you. And it will also become part of a, a window. So that, that also gives you a window with an allocated buffer. And when you call MPI win free, it will free the buffer in this case as well. In this case, it will not free the buffer because it was your buffer to begin with. You had allocated it, so you are responsible for freeing it. Uh, there is another mode, uh, another window creation function, a different one, called MPI win create dynamic, where you don't pass any buffer yet. It, it, it is, uh, you, you can dynamically attach buffers by another function called MPI win attach, and then they become part, they become effectively a, a you know, a window, or they, are, they get uh, exposed. So if you, this is a more dynamic model where you just call this window creation function uh, once with no buffer passed to it at all, no buffer associated with it. But you cannot do any RMA until you call MPI win attach. And, and win attach is a local operation. So rank zero could attach a local buffer to that window. And after it has done that, other processes could start doing RMA to that. Uh, uh, to that buffer. And the fourth uh, uh, function is uh, also an MPI3 function, uh, win allocate shared. And what it does is it, it, is, uh, it allocates shared memory. So, uh, so it, this will work only on a node where shared memory, only on, on a set of processes where shared memory can be allocated. So typically, it will be on a single physical node. So if you have, say, on a, on a blue gene, if you have 16 cores per node, uh, they can share memory, so the, the MPI can allocate a shared memory buffer. Uh, but to do that, you have to pass the right communicator and so forth. So there, there are some more details so that you, you pass a, a communicator comprising uh, processes that can share memory. And there's a way to get that communicator also. So there's another convenience function on how to do that. But the basic idea here is that there is a way for the system for, for the MPI implementation to give you a shared memory buffer that you can do e either direct load stores to or you can do one-sided operations to. But it's still, 
within a limited space. It will be typically within your a single physical node. So not it will not be across the whole machine, just within a node. Now you could do this yourself uh, as well. You, know, you can use some uh, the POSIX uh, shared memory functions or the system five shared memory functions wherever they're supported and get your own shared. It's just a little more tedious to. To, to use those functions, and this would be a, a portable way to do that. So you can uh, you can use what is called uh, what we call MPI plus MPI type of programming, where it's the MPI plus X hybrid model, where X is equal to MPI, and that can happen where you can get a shared memory buffer this way, and you can directly do shared memory, you know, direct loads and stores to that uh, buffer. So we'll look at what, uh, at least what, what some of these functions uh, look like. So MPI win create is the very basic uh, window creation function from MPI2. Uh, what it takes is uh, an, a, bay, uh, an ad, a pointer, starting pointer, uh, the size of the window, window. So this is your, you know, if you have a big buffer, you, you pass the base address and the size of that buffer. That is, uh, that is your local memory that you want to uh, expose. This displacement unit is uh, a parameter for you to indicate what is the data type of this uh, buffer. So let's say if these were all double precision, you could pass the, the displacement unit as size of double. Uh, and the advantage here is when, when some other process is doing puts and gets at certain locations in this window, it can do these, uh, it, it can specify the, the target, the locations as units of that data type. So instead of doing byte level calculation, it could say, uh, write it at an offset of 32, where 32 means 32 double precision numbers where, and so that, that, it gets that by specifying the right displacement unit. If you don't understand it right now, that's okay, just ignore it. Uh, you know, when you, need to, when you need to actually write a code, you can, you can figure that out. You can always pass this unit as one, but then you will have to do the actual byte calculations when you're doing an MPI put, uh, and the, the actual target address calculation would be in, in bytes in that case. So it's, it's better to do size of uh, whatever is your data type. It'll be easier for you. Uh, MPI info uh, is a way to pass hints to the MPI in, in implementation or, uh, about performance. And this thing is used in a few different parts of MPI. It's used in the IO chapter. It's used in one-sided. It's used in dynamic. And everywhere where you, you need to, it's a portable way of passing hints. It's not, it's, uh, we don't have time to cover this, and so you can always pass MPI info null in you know, all caps, which is saying, uh, which means zero, you know, nothing. I'm not, I'm not providing any, you any performance hits. Just do the default, and that'll always work. Later on, when you want to do some tuning and you know, for, based on where you're running on, on which MPI implementation, you can look at what, what hints are, are useful there, and the hints are nothing but uh, strings, you know, key value pairs. Uh, uh, that you, you sort of add to this or attach to the info object, and, and then you pass that. Again, that's some detail that you can look into when you, when you need to do it. Uh, the input, or the, uh, the other parameter is the communicator over which this function is collective. So this, uh, you know, if it's, if it's everyone, you can pass MPI com world. And what it returns to you is a window object, or, you know, which is of type MPI win. And from now on, you'll just use this window object in your puts and gets. You won't, you won't see this communicator uh, again. Uh, in some sense, the communicator will be hidden in this window object. So internally, in some data structure, we will have that uh, information. But uh, the, the RMA functions don't take a communicator after, uh, after this point. So once you have done this, so, what, so now everyone calls this. But not everyone may have a memory that they want to expose. It could be that only rank zero wants to expose its memory. Others don't want to. But they still have to call the function. They can all pass the null in a null out here. So they can say that null and zero, and that means they don't have anything to expose. But they'll be part of this one collective, and they will get one window object. If they've not exposed anything, that means nobody can access that data. Only the one that has passed a valid buffer can be a target of one-sided operations. So this is the very first thing you need to do uh, before you can start doing any uh, RME operation. So this is just specifying the memory to, so OK, this is an example. This might be make it more clear. So let's, let's say you have some integer array here, you, and which you're going to allocate here. Uh, and this is your MPI win object, which is just declared here. So this is an opaque, uh, you know, an MPI has several of these opaque uh, you know, objects where you don't know what, what they are. They are defined in the MPI.h file, but you don't need to worry about it. Uh, 
so you call MPI init, you allocate this array out here, and then you can, so it's private memory at this point, you can initialize it to whatever you want. And now, when you want to expose it, you call MPI win create, everybody's calling it, so it's MPI com world. So you say A, and uh, the size is 1,000. Uh, so I think this, 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 this is a bug because the size should be in bytes, right? This is the disp unit, is the size of int is the disp unit, but the size of the window object should be 1,000 into size of int, I think. Then after you do this, so this is your displacement unit, this is your info null, so I, as I said earlier, and for the most part, you can just assume that use info null, you're not doing anything fancy. Uh, you com world is your communicator, you get back this window object, and now you can do your puts and gets, and we'll see that in, in later slides. And at the end of everything, you can call MPI win free. After all your RMA is done, you want to free whatever resources are associated with this, so you call MPI win free. At this point, it does not free this array. So uh, in this program, we have not, we've been careless and we've not freed uh, mm -hmm. uh, this array. So really, there should be a, a free of A here. If the program ends, it'll get uh, deallocated you know, in, any, in any case. So this is the other uh, uh, window creation function called win allocate. Uh, this is new in MPI 3. And the difference is, as I said, this one allocates memory for you. The MPI implementation allocates memory for you. So you don't pass. So what you pass is just the size and there is no, so this one takes a base address, right? So this is the base of the memory you have allocated. Uh, this one doesn't have that base parameter at the beginning because there is no, you, you don't have anything to begin with. You get back a pointer to something that is allocated. You just say the size you want and of course the displacement unit which is the size of double or whatever I, I said. Again, info is, could be info null. Again, the communicator of whatever your you know, MPI com world. And this is a return parameter. So it allocates and returns a pointer to you, to your, again, to your local, uh, to a buffer in your local memory, which is now going to be part of this window. So the example, compared with the previous example, the difference is that there is no malloc statement here. There is no malloc, and you, you don't need a free either, because the win free will free what it's allocated. And, uh, so here, uh, you do the, 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 the total size uh, and the displacement unit, the info null, the com world, and it, 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 it uh, sets this pointer to point to a, an allocated array that it has allocated for you. Otherwise, it's the same. I mean, after this, it doesn't, uh, you know, everything else is the same. So the, the third one I said is uh, win create dynamic. So, this just creates uh, an RMA window to which data can be, or a buffer can be attached later. Uh, there, there's no buffer at, attached at, at this point. And there is uh, these functions win. The same example with win create dynamic would be, uh, you call win create dynamic right at the top before you know, there's no array allocated or assigned or anything. So at this point, the win, there is a window object, but there is no buffer assigned to it. So if you do, RMA at this point, it'll be an error because you, you don't know where, the, there's nothing at, attached to it. So then you, you have to attach some buffer to it using this function MPI win attach. So that is your allocated array. So again, you're allocating it and you're uh, attaching it. And now once this, and this is a local function, so it's, this, is not, this is not collective. So each, uh, each process can do it at any time. So the question is how would someone else know that this process has called win attach or not. So that would need some additional handshake in your code, or if your algorithm is such that you can, you can tell by the logic of the algorithm itself that this has happened, then, then it's fine, or you'll need some other handshake with maybe with a barrier or a two-sided uh, communication or something. But assume that you know that, that once this has happened, then some other process can do puts and gets to this array, uh, to this window basically. And at, at the end of, again, here you have to know, before calling win detach, you have to know that no, one, no one's going to write to this, that everyone has finished writing. So again, either you need to do some kind of a handshake with other processes, or your, your program's logic, your algorithm's logic, 
may just you may just know based on that 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 has happened, and then it's uh, then you can do a detach because if you do a detach before something else comes and that will still that will be an error because somebody is trying to communicate with you and you have detached it from here, and the, and the reason this was added is. Uh, the, the problem with the win create one is that it is it's specific to a particular buffer. So you have to keep on calling win. If you had many different bu uh, you know, buffers, you have to keep calling them. And, and if you are dynamically creating and freeing, again, you have to keep calling the win create functions, which are collective. And they are slightly heavyweight. I mean, they're not meant to be called repeatedly. So win create is like a file open. Or, you know, these functions are meant to be called once, and then you do all your stuff. They're not meant to be called repeatedly. So to get around that problem, uh, this is how. So the data movement functions are, uh, I've already talked about uh, get, put, and accumulate. These are new functions in MPI 3. So what MPI get accumulate, so th th these were missing in MPI 2, and th that was a problem. And these are atomic read, modify, write operations in, in some sense. So what get accumulate does is it not only does an accumulate operation, but it returns the previous value that was stored there. And this is an atomic, uh, in an, uh, this, this, there can be no other process docking around there while this is happening. So you're, you're sure that the, the, the value you got in the get was the value that, uh, that was there just before you did your accumulate. So it's an a, a, a atomic read, modify, uh, write type of uh, function. Uh, there is a, a compare and swap operation. I, I have another slide on that. And that was also a, a missing feature. So this is a type of function that is used in parallel algorithms like lock-free queues, or if you want to do uh, concurrent lists uh, in a lock-free manner, you need compare and swap type of operations, which were missing. And then fetch and, uh, fetch and op is a simplified version of get accumulate in which you can't have derived data types. So it will just be faster than that. And, and we'll look at that in a little bit. So just to, uh, now how do you do a get or put? I've been talking about uh, this. So we're, we're doing an MPI get from this process. Uh, I mean, this process is calling MPI get. So the, the, the process calling the function is called the source, and the process on which the, from, uh, the other process is called the, the target. So that could be the one from which you get data or the one to which you write data to using put. So in this case, in MPI put, uh, MPI get, we are getting, this process is calling MPI get to get data from the window of this target process. So the parameter list is the origins address count data type. So this specifies the origin buffer in the origin memory. So that's nothing special. It's like an MPI receives buff count data type. That's easy to understand. The target rank is the rank of the target from which you want to get. So this will go to a specific rank uh, that you're saying. And that now where, where in that, the other thing you need to know is in this target's memory, where, uh, from where to get the data. So that's specified by these parameters, the target displacement and the count and data type. So the displacement uh, specifies starting from the base address of the window that this process provided. So the A, you know, let's say it was that A uh, array that this process uh, provided. The displacement uh, says, starting from the base of A, how much to skip. And it is uh, scaled by that displacement unit. Just, just let, let me just finish. It is scaled by the displacement unit. So in win create, you remember the displacement unit function, which I said size of double or whatever. So this target displacement gets multiplied by that displacement unit. So you could, if it was all double precision, you could say displacement, target displacement is 16 or whatever you want. And then that gets multiplied by size of, automatically by size of the double, and you get the right location. If you did not use the displacement unit and you just passed as one, then you would have to do 16 times size of double in this guy, right here in this get function, and then it would go to the right location. So that's just, again, that's just detail. And then starting from that location, you know, where the displacement is, then that's the usual count and data type. So you know, that's the usual MPI buff count data type. So this, this target displacement effectively gives the starting address from where to start this count and data type. And this data type re refers to a data type on the target. So it could be something different from this, but they have to be compatible, they have to match in, in, in some sense. And it could be a derived data type. It doesn't have to be a basic data type. So the, you remember all the uh, vector indexed struct, all those data types that Bill said. So you can do all that even in one side in here. And then once, so again, this is a non-blocking function. It'll come, it'll return immediately. You, you won't get the data right away, but you have to, we'll, we'll get to the synchronization functions where you, that's when the operation will complete. 
So you can issue many of these gets or puts and then complete them at some point. If you want to get contiguous data and store it non-contiguously, so here it's non-contiguous, here it's contiguous. So what you would do is your origin data type, which is this, this could be an indexed type that you have created. And this target type could be MPI int. And the only thing is that the product of this count and data type and this count and data type should match. So you're, you know, the equal amounts of data on both sides. So this is one-sided communication, but it has the MPI flavor in it. It has all these data types, and it, you know, if you understand, if you know MPI communication, you can do this. So the same thing for put. Now it's in the reverse direction. So the first three parameters refer to the data in your buffer that you want to put somewhere. And so since it's your buffer, you can start with at whatever index you want, and that's the origin address that you, that you pass, then the count in the data type. The target rank, that is the rank of this process. And the same target displacement count and data type. So this displacement will, starting from the base of this window of this target, will, will displace, you know, will be the offset into that. And then the count and data type on the target side, which could be different than the data type here, but matching. The, the, the type should, should match. And by type should match means you could have, a, as somebody asked, you could have a contiguous set of integers on one side and a vector of integers on the other side. So that's, uh, that's matching. But if you have integers on one side and floating point on the other, that would be, a, uh, that would be an error. So it's the same. And, and again, this doesn't complete the operation. It just starts, it, it's a non-blocking uh, put. And the third one is the accumulate, which is like a put. It's, it's you know, the uh, parameters are the same. With one additional parameter is that it is not overwriting di this directly. It's performing some mathematical operation, the same as reduce. So you can do all, do all those MPI sum, pro, uh, you know, all of them. And in addition, there is one more uh, uh, operation you can perform that reduce doesn't perform. Uh, it's called MPI replace. And if you do an accumulate with MPI replace, it's like a put. It just replaces the existing data with the uh, original uh, data. So that accumulate with replace is like a put. The only difference is the, there are some difference in semantics in that Concurrent accumulates are allowed, whereas concurrent puts can overwrite and uh, result in garbage data. So if two processes are doing concurrent puts to the same location at the same time, they could overwrite each other. Whereas if they are accumulates, they are guaranteed to be atomic. And uh, so, so that, that's the difference. So you could, you could use, if you want to do something like that, you could do a accumulate with a uh, replace. So, th so that's the atomic put is what it uh, gives you. Uh, the other restriction is that this, uh, these operations with this arithmetic that you do here, is restricted only to the MPI predefined operations. So those are the MPI sum, max, min, you know, uh, the whole list that I showed you. Uh, only those are allowed. The next slide that I had on user-defined operations, which could, you know, where you have to specify commutative or not, those are not allowed for accumulate. Uh, you are allowed to have derived data types, though, for, uh, for accumulate uh, on, on the target side. Uh, so the new MPI function, uh, MPI3 function, as I said, was get accumulate. So it is MPI underscore get underscore accumulate. So this does an accumulate and returns the previous value before the accumulate operation happens. So it's like it does a get first and then does the accumulate on it. But that is done in an atomic fashion. That is, no other process can sneak in and meddle in the middle in this thing. So you're, you're guaranteed to get the, just the previous value that was there before the accumulate happened. So it's an atomic fetch and op in some sense. In, in some sense. Fetch, so you can do a fetch and increment. So there are some uh, algorithms that require a fe atomic fetch and increment. Uh, if you want to do a, uh, there's a counter somewhere that you want to increment and, and know the previous value. And there are many threads doing this, you know, or many processes doing this. You can use something like, uh, like this. And you can also get a get-like behavior with MPI no op here. So if you pass MPI no op as the op to get accumulate, nothing will happen. There will be no arithmetic operation. You'll just get the get. So it becomes an atomic get. Uh, so in terms of uh, ordering, uh, for put get operations, it doesn't matter so much because, as I said, if you do uh, you, uh, the concurrent, concurrent gets are OK because they're read only. There is no writing there. But if you're doing a put and a get or two puts at the same time to the same location, that's not allowed in the, in the same synchronization period. We have not talked about the synchronization, but it's within a synchronization. You're not allowed to do this two puts to the same uh, location. 
but as I said, two accumulates are uh, are allowed because they are they are guaranteed to be uh, atomic, and therefore you, with the MPI replace you can do an atomic put. And there is some more feat, some more thing in MPI three about ordering of accumulate operations, which is a little more advanced co uh, concept. But I, I think I'll just skip that for now. There there are some hints you can pass in the MPI info structure to get a particular kind of ordering in a read after write or write after write. Okay, and the additional, uh, the atomic operations, as I said, there was compare and swap and, and fetch and op. So fetch and op is easy. It's actually MPI get accumulate with restrictions. So there are restrictions on which operations you can use and I think it's restricted to basic data types. And the reason this is provided is there could be fast hardware support for just the fetch and increment. Uh, if you're just doing fetch and increment on a byte or, a, or an int, that's easy to support in hardware. But if you're doing a get accumulate on derived data types and whatnot, that, that has to go through some software uh, layer. So that can, that'll be slower. So this can just give you a fast implementation of some commonly needed uh, functionality that get accumulate also provides you. And compare and swap is a different operation and if I put the parameter list, it'll take two lines or three lines, and it's a, it has many parameters to that function. But what, what this does is it compare, I and mean, this is an operation well known in the computer science literature. So if you are, uh, if you have dealt with parallel algorithms or uh, anything that requires concurrent uh, list updates and so forth, they, this is something that is uh, uh, you know, talked about. Uh, so what, what this does is you compare the value at the target with an input value provided on the uh, on the caller side, the one, the, the process calling this function. And if they are the same, then you replace this target value with another value on the, <laughs> on the input side. So there are several buffers. There is the, there is this compare buffer. There is the input, uh, there is another buffer whose value you would actually store there. And there's also this buffer on the target side. So w what is actually done is this compare value is compared with the value on the target. If they are okay, then if they are the same, that is then there is another buffer whose, whose value is written onto the target. So the target is replaced with a new value. Just, just let it be for now, we're not gonna, see it's useful for linked list creations and you know, linked list insertions and so forth. We're not doing that exercise uh, today. So it's just something for you to know. The reason we need these synchronization functions is because we, ha we have one-sided communication. Uh, how do you know that you know, somebody else's window is ready for, you know, ready to be accessed? And how do you know that all these operations have completed because they're all non-blocking? Uh, uh, how do you know that you know, th th there has to be some way to specify, okay, I, I, I'm not ready for someone else uh, to, to, to read data from because I'm still computing this data. It's not, yet, it's not yet meant for use by others. So you need some synchronization functions to, to do that. So there are three types of synchronization to, uh, functions in MPI. Two of them are called active target because then they need to be called on both the origin and the target. So the target doesn't participate in data transfer, right? The puts and gets and accumulates are just on the origin side. The target is doing nothing. But if you're using these, these kinds of synchronizations, the target needs to call the synchronization function. So it, that's why it's called active target. The target is actively do, doing at least that much. Uh, the third one is truly one-sided in the sense that the target doesn't call any function, literally. The synchronization is also just on the on the source side, and, and we'll, see, we'll see what that is. And there, there, are some, there are additional functions in MPI3 to do some more stuff, which also we'll look at. So this is the simplest, uh, uh, this is the simplest synchronization. Uh, so it's called uh, a fence, and it's also collective. It's collective over the window. And what does collective over the window mean? When you called the win creation function, there was a communicator you passed. So that identified a group of processes. So that is still associated with this window. So it's collective over that original group of processes. So that means everyone must call this uh, function. So the simple way of thinking of, of this is, if you have to do a bunch of puts and gets, you need to bracket them with, uh, with fences. So you do a fence, do your puts and gets, and others can also do puts and gets, and then, then you do another fence. And when the second fence is called, it means that everything is over. It means that all these have completed both locally and also at the at the target, and there's no more. You know, you're not going to get any more of these RMA operations. You can you can again do f fence after that uh, as well. So it's it's kind of simple to understand, but the drawback is that it's now collective. Again, it's collective over 
the whole set of processes. So if you're doing uh, communication among smaller groups of processes, let's say I'm communicating only with my neighbors, and we are a million MPI processes, everyone communicating with their nine neighbors or whatever, it's unnecessarily synchronizing all million of them, right? Uh, the, the communications can get skewed enough that there's no reason for everyone to synchronize. You can synchronize just with your neighbors and let everyone synchronize with their neighbors and, and let them just go on uh, to the extent they can. So uh, to fix that problem of you know, unnecessary making it collective over everybody, the second method is similar to this, but it's not, it's not collective over the whole thing. It's a little uh, harder to understand when you actually look at the the details of it, but the idea here is you get to define the groups of processes that are, uh, that are actually communicating with each other. So let's say if everyone is communicating with their nearest neighbors, you can form MPI group objects just comprising those neighbors. And so now these, these new uh, functions, and there, there are four of them, uh, it's MPI win post and MPI win wait and start and uh, complete. These take these group objects as parameters, and they are, uh, in some sense, collective only over those group objects. So this is in the uh, reverse direction. So the origin is here, and target is here. The, the origin is the one that is issuing one-sided communication, has to sort of indicate that, OK, I'm going to start my uh, operations, and it calls MPI win start. And then it can do all its gets and puts and whatever. And at the end of them, it calls MPI win complete, and the target that is the target of RMA calls two different set of functions, post and wait. The, 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 the parameters to these functions take these group objects that I was saying, which, can, which are smaller than the whole uh, collection. So the, it's a little more complicated to understand and to, to do all this, but performance-wise, it it's, it's better than fence. Fence is just easy. You throw in a fence, and you know, it's just one function. But it, it makes it collective. Everyone must call it, you know, and you're, you're synchronizing this synchronizes smaller groups, so it's, it's uh, potentially better performance. Although it can be, so it's called post start complete wait, you know, PSCW. And t uh, you know, typically what can happen is if this process is also doing one-sided, and then it also has to call start and complete. So you, you might see something like post start complete wait on, and here also post start complete wait on this side as well, because it can be both origin and target, right? They, they, they need to exchange data in one sided. So that's how it typically looks. There is some ordering. So I think the win wait uh, will wait for the complete to be called. Uh, I'm not sure the start waits for the post. Uh, there, there is some other ordering here. But this, this is just a rough diagram. It, it, it's not intended to um, indicate that. But w what it is supposed to do is, before issuing any one-sided, you need to call start. And at the end of them, this will complete. Uh, they'll be complete when you call complete. And the, uh, the target side has to expose its window using post and wait. There's no non-blocking fence. Uh, but the first fence, uh, let me, uh, if I could, what I can tell you is that this, the second fence is effectively like a barrier in that sense, in the sense that uh, it, wo it, it won't return. If you, if you think through the semantics of how it can work, there's no way it can return until everyone has reached the fence. So internally, it, it, will act, it, won't act, it may not actually call a barrier, but its logic will be similar to a barrier. The first fence need not do anything, literally, because a valid implementation of MPI, uh, one-sided, can do nothing. I mean, just, uh, just queue up all the operations and implement everything in the fence. That is also a valid, and, and we do that in some, in some cases. In most cases, the lock unlock, you know, people, those who do one sided, find benefit by using lock unlock because that is the more, uh, the, the true one sided. Uh, this has some advantages because if you want to know, uh, so even with lock unlock, you may not know whether the operation is, how will the target know that the data has been deposited in some sense? And so you, need, you might need some, some synchronization in the first place. So you could use fence in, in that case. So you have to see what fits your algorithm uh, and on your machine, what works well is the, is the other thing. Let's go to the third uh, synchronization. So this is truly one-sided. Uh, uh, so let's look, just look at the right part of the figure. The, uh, the left part is the previous slide, basically, the, the post-start complete weight. Uh, in the passive target, uh, this is called passive target synchronization. There are two functions, MPI win lock and MPI win unlock. 
they don't actually acquire uh, a lock, so it's not it's a uh, the, the name. It's not the best choice of uh, of name. Uh, so what MPI uh, Win Lock does is it gets access to the window, and these are non-blocking. I mean, the, the Win Lock is non-blocking. Un unlock is not non-blocking. It gets access to the window on the target side, uh, either shared or exclusive access. So one of the parameters to Win Lock is is do you want shared or, uh, or exclusive? And that, that's your choice. Uh, so it gets access to that window, and then you can call MPI get or put or whatever. And when you, uh, again, this is non-blocking, so nothing, you got, nothing is guaranteed to happen until you call win unlock, and that's where the operation uh, completes. And the target doesn't really know when it has completed, because there's nothing being called on the target here. So, so this is one-sided in, in, in any um, definition. So this is somewhat like a shared memory model, uh, except that you cannot directly do loads and stores. You have to do put, get, accumulate, whatever. Yeah. The, sem the, the semantics of this specifies that if the, uh, if the target wants to access its own window, it should also acquire a lock. It should call MPI win lock, unlock locally as well. And that's just to maintain the consistency semantics. So if this is supposed to work on, you know, on a non-cache coherent system and so forth, then it has to be done that way. OK, so this is what the function looks like. It's MPI win lock. See, the first parameter is the lock type, which could be MPI, uh, what's it called? MPI win, uh, MPI ex something exclusive is the name, and MPI something shared. Uh, this is the target rank. So MPI win lock has to specify uh, the lock on a particular rank. MPI 3 has added this MPI lock, lock all function. So you can get acquire a lock on all ranks, but it's a, share, it's a shared lock. You, there's no. That doesn't support exclusive uh, locks there. And uh, we, we release the lock with win unlock, which is, again, the same rank and, and win. So uh, yeah, this is the lock type, shared, and exclusive uh, out here. Uh, the local window, uh, as the, the question he asked, is what if I want to modify my own data that's in the window? Then I would acquire an exclusive lock, do a local update just using load stores, and then release the exclusive lock, and then others can try to update. So that's another, so that's where the shared lock might hang. In. So, I mean, wait. So when, when, should, I, when should you use uh, passive mode? Is it's, in, uh, it's when in, in a truly irregular computation where, uh, where you don't know who, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's less clear who's going to access data when and, and from whom. Of course, the data has to be available at the right time. So you need some synchronization to make sure that the data is ready to be read. But that's, again, part of your algorithm. And it, it, it does end up getting used in, uh, in, in lots of places like this. Okay, so that was one-sided communication.